Before Jesus, the Jewish people knew pretty well what they were looking for. Their prophets, matriarchs, and patriarchs spoke words of wisdom that described the character and action of Yahweh and told of ways that God might show up in the future. Messianic hope. They described how God works, how God sets people free, both from spiritual bondage and from the oppression of other nations and peoples. They told of the source of wisdom, a certain kind of revolutionary wisdom that ran contrary to the ways of the world. They told of one who heals and guides into truth and gives hope. They knew the signs of the presence of God. Whether those signs showed up in the words of David or Deborah, in the liberation of those who had been in slavery, or of the fiery warnings of the prophet Jeremiah. Signs of God's presence. People looked around, read into, perhaps, signs in the world. Can we really expect such things in 2015? What are we watching for this Advent, this time that is set aside by the church to watch and wait? What is it that we expect this Advent? Not literally the baby in the manger. And I assume that we aren't watching for the man Jesus returning in the clouds. When we long for God, for God's presence in a tangible way, What signs might tell us that God is near? Now when distress and fear come over you, Jesus said, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. When distress and fear come over you. This is the Advent message. Advent, of course, literally means to come, specifically for God to come into human life. These four weeks before Christmas remind us, tempt us to believe that God is up to something, that God indeed does come to us, on us, and into human life, into our hearts and cultures, and just maybe into our time Our texts for today, for every first Sunday of Advent, catch me by surprise each year. They always seem an odd beginning to this Advent season. We don't hear anything about a baby in a manger. We don't hear an angel's song. We don't even hear voices of prophets speaking of stars and magi. Rather, we get an apocalyptic warning. Now, if we look back just a little bit in this 21st chapter of Luke, we discover what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about a specific event in Jerusalem's history, the destruction of the temple. But in this, he's saying something else, perhaps. Warning. When it's dark, watch out for God. Could it be that watching for God to come into our world includes more than anticipating the birth of Jesus year after year? Could it be that this season offers us opportunities to consider just what the birth of Jesus means then and now when we see other ways that God breaks into our world? Could it be that Jesus is saying to us even now, watch those places, watch those places of distress and fear. Watch them in this world, here and now. Because God can bring liberation and hope and restoration to those very places. When you see these signs, know that systems of power are overturned as God's work is done then as well as now. Pay attention. Because when distress troubles you, valleys shall be exalted and mountains shall be made low. Yes, even now. I believe that Jesus describes here the drama of human living. A cycle that's repeated in cultures and in individual lives. And in doing that, he assures us that the promise is still 
to come, to come to us. We recognize the pattern, I think, three stages. First, life's complexities and troubles and conflicts seem more than we can bear. We all know that, right? We know it individually. We know it globally. Then, two, we glimpse somehow through our desperation and fear that distant presence of God, something holy and beyond us that offers us a glimmer of hope. Three, but while this hope beckons to us, something in us, Disbelief, cynicism, unwillingness, modern rationale pushes against God's nudging and liberating and empowering presence. Kierkegaard calls this anxiety and says that while this hope has the power to change us, we experience both sides of it. We experience both attraction and repulsion to God's inbreaking into our lives and into the world. Jesus names those responses that we have to keep God's liberation at bay. Be on guard, he says, so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world. So, Rather than seeing the hope, going towards the places of health and help, we can become paralyzed with fear. We second guess what's going to happen next. We wait for the other shoe to drop. I was at a particularly fearful place in my life and had a friend come to really offer me comfort and help And I said, I just feel like I'm always waiting for the other shoe to drop. And my friend Janet looked at me and she said, Glenna, you're all out of shoes. No more shoes to drop. But we don't believe it. We wait for the other shoe to drop. We're weighed down with what Jesus calls dissipation. That is spread thin to the point of vanishing. Take that in. We are spread thin to the point of vanishing, dissipation. We find ways to escape our pain. Jesus talks about drunkenness, but we we know that's all just one way, only one way that we find to avoid coming to grips with those places where we need God and help. We worry. We let our priorities get out of kilter. We confuse what we can't change with what we can. We live in cynicism rather than hope afraid to believe that God just might be ready to do a new thing. An early liturgical cycle, lectionary cycle, pairs this reading today, the reading of Jesus, with the story of Noah. This is yet another telling of this human drama of despair and hopelessness that is addressed by the coming of God's redemption, an ark in the storm. Another example where God emerges or we can see God in the dark of trouble and threat. When distress and fear come over you, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing nigh. This hope is historical, of course. It's about the destruction of the temple and about the birth of Jesus. This hope is also eschatological, that is, that God is our ultimate hope. And God's hope, and this is the most important one, I think, for us here and now, God's hope is existential. It's for all who find ourselves in pain or as captives or alone or poor or powerless, for all who suffer and for even those of us who resist God's help. God breaks in with an ark and a flood, with a parted sea when the weight of freedom seems like death with a baby in a manger when a nation seems doomed. God seems to always come at a point of desperation and vulnerability and darkness. But when you think about it, darkness may be when we can see God most clearly. Advent, 
This time of waiting begins in darkness, literally in days that are short and darkness is long. A time without clarity of vision where much is unknown in times of fear and foreboding. But darkness is also pregnant with possibility. The fertile conditions that promote germination are when seeds are in the darkness of earth before they burst forth. Darkness provides protection for dangerous passage, suggests mystery and change. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, Carl Jung wrote, but by making the darkness conscious. Into this darkness, God can enter. Advent calls us to look again for signs of God. It calls us where we are, knowing our need, our need to find help beyond ourselves, our need to sense holy presence, our need for peace in this violent world, a need to see the hope that we can offer when needs are great and threats so real. Advent calls us to hear again the voice of the one who calls us to live justly and to see signs of God's passion and clarity. Is it possible that God can come to us again in ways that make a difference in our world? Will we see? Will we recognize God and hope, opportunities for freedom and encounters with the Spirit? This Advent, I invite us into the dark, into that fertile ground of need and knowing in which God is prone to show up. I invite you in to experience Advent's waiting and longing before we celebrate the light breaking forth. Let's take a deep breath and not hurry through Advent this year. Rather, let's plumb its dark depths. I invite you into that dark that puts away easy answers, that defies sugar-coated, hopeful religion, that waits just a few weeks for the sentimental Christmas card messages. Come, rather, into the places of the soul where night-blooming plants open to the darkness. Come into the dark where no light can distract. Come willingly into struggle and despair. Come into the dark, the place of birth, where God can meet us. There, in the dark, Let's watch for signs of God that are visible only in the dark of our own souls and of the world. After all, that star that is said to point the way can only be seen in the dark. Amen.